Gordon Bell has had a long and varied career. An early employee of Digital Equipment Corporation, designer of many of DEC's PDP series of mini computers, leader in computer science at the National Science Foundation, longtime proponent of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, and the creator and funder of the Gordon Bell Prize, which annually the ACM awards for improvements to parallel and scalable computing. Today, he's a researcher emeritus at Microsoft. I recently met with Bell at the Computer History Museum in front of a fully restored and operational PDP-1. Well, the PDP-1 is the first computer that uh, I really did engineering on. Maybe it's the second, because I got to digital uh, from MIT, uh, where they had a machine called the TX-0, which was the forerunner, in fact, maybe the prototype for the PDP-1 that was designed at Lincoln Laboratory, first transit, one of the first transistorized computers. And I had built a tape control unit for this. What I needed was uh, all these modules, flip-flops, AND gates, OR gates, all of the component things that uh, are so low level to uh, computer scientists. These are, uh, these are, you know, tiny areas of a piece of silicon. Those, those were the components. And so I went to Digital, who was selling components, to buy those. And uh, so I bought, I don't know, 50 of them and put them together to make a tape control unit. At that time, I was starting down the PhD route. I was a uh, staff engineer doing uh, speech research. And so we needed the tape unit just to get more speech and more I.O. Uh, but what I did was a speech uh, analysis system called Analysis by Synthesis, which is still, the paper, by the way, was the first one of these, uh, and it's still referred to because it's a technique for, you know, now you'd call it an AI technique. It was a way of understanding what was going on in the uh, vocal tract. And anyway, what I learned from that was the that uh, basically I didn't want to be a researcher, that I really was an engineer, and certainly above all, I didn't want to be, be a speech researcher because I said, you know, it was, I've, I've, ex, I've experienced this with two or three speech researchers uh, since that time. Uh, one of them uh, was telling, describing this in an ARPA con, uh, contractor that he was going to, conquer speech and anybody who tries looks at speech and you say my god I can kind of recognize that why I should be able to write a program and so I basically said okay where I'll, where do you want us to send the Nobel Prize right. when you do that and it was just and so I got out I said it was going to take 20 years to do it and I was wrong by 40 I was wrong it was it took took about actually we did make progress by 80s yeah. But early '80s, that Actually, there was space some early digital recognition. PCs had some voice recognition. In uh, yeah, in about that time. Yeah. But uh, but to get to the point uh, where we are now is, is taking. So, so you were buying data. components. We were like, buying. How big was a flip flop? Uh, a flip flop. Like, like Actually, big? a flip flop was on a board about this big, or I think depending on the speed and what it would do, but. Uh, I think we could get maybe two to four flip-flops. Uh, uh, you know, if they were shift registers, you could get more. But if they were, you know, J, K, R, S, the full bore, uh, you know, maybe just get one of them. And those were running at the deck uh, modules at that time were running at uh, f at five megahertz. So these are all all five megahertz. Uh, I enjoyed the the building of the program to do analysis by synthesis, the building of the hardware, making all of that work, and then the building of the tape unit. And But I had really uh, wanted to do the engineering aspect. And so I've basically spent my life mostly uh, thinking as an engineer. In fact, I'd say over the last 10 years, uh, I've been an accidental researcher. <laughs> I... Uh, did uh, you know? I've been responsible for for managing research uh, in a you know overall. I was head of R and D at at 
uh, digital equipment comp uh, company. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, I my uh, my uh, aspirations and my uh, activities were all directed to uh, to uh, getting getting to building things in volume that people would want to use. So tell us a little bit about this PDP-1 and how its building sort of triggered, I mean, was it, did it end up triggering things that you didn't intend? I think any time you build a new component, a new component is introduced, it uh, opens up totally new doors. The interesting thing about the PDP-1 as the, as, I'd say it's a forerunner for the mini computer, and we could go look at right. what a mini computer, what I define a mini computer is. This was 1960. By, in 19, by 1965, we built a thing that was, um, we, I would, uh, that I claim is the first uh, classical mini computer. And the reason it's that is, uh, although this was a component, was used as a component in some sense, the classical mini was actually built as a component. It was to be used for something else. And I'd say the big, big thing you should take away from that, this is that in every generation, you get a machine that is, a computer that is a component, the microprocessor, uh, as it was first came out, was a was a component. Once it got the microprocessor got a little bit bigger, the PC that began to be used as a component. In fact, we what we just talked about was this this guy here, the cell phone, is now a component. This is the most amazing component you could ever get. You know, we would never thought of that as a component because what's in it is, gee, I've got maybe 32, 64 gigabytes of secondary storage so it'll store everything. It's got enormous processing power. It's got many radios in it. Uh, and it's got an accelerometer. It's got a, a GPS unit. And guess what? Who wants one of those? Well, the, all of these end copter things, the, the geocopter three, the three blade thing, the four blade, the six blade, there's a saw a 12 blade that carries people the other day. All of those things are controlled by this being the central part of that. In a sense, when you first build something like the PDP-1, you need to keep it flexible because you don't even yeah. know exactly what its purpose is. Absolutely. This, the beautiful thing that, the fun we had with the PDP-1, and I can could go back and open the door there and show you was the I.O. system. The th thing that, in fact, the first documentation I did uh, on about the PDP-1 was I wrote a book, not a book, a 32-page manual about how to connect stuff to the PDP-1 because I that we were enamored with. How do you connect to that? And then the difference between the PDP-1 and then subsequent uh, machines that we built were really the I.O. got much, much more flexible, got easier to use, so that when somebody could read that manual, they'd say, oh my God, I'm going to connect that to a process, con process control. I'm going to connect that and make it an oscilloscope. I'm going to make it a pulse height analyzer. And so, in a sense, uh, what, in, what the mini computer did, it enabled the computer to be used as a component in sort of everything, and that's that's where it was. And you know, in I ta uh, I just wrote an article about the birth and death, uh, birth and I guess I don't remember rise and fall of rise and fall rise and fall of the mini computer. And uh, basically, uh, the editor, you know, I went back and forth with the editors, but. What happened was I had to, to say, look, the function that we were creating here had not, there was nothing like it in the past. It wasn't, wasn't a scaled down mainframe that you could interact with. That wasn't the goal that we had. It wasn't, a, so it wasn't a record keeper. It wasn't a computer in the sense 
of a supercomputer, we, we weren't after numbers and we weren't after bits and keeping records. We were after a component that could be used in any number of ways and it ended up being used to do message switching, to have telegraph lines come in and, and telegraph lines going out, which is the core part of, of networking today. Uh, the internet it all works on having computers that have bits coming in and out and moving them around. And it was also a bit, the ability to have analog sensing information from a, uh, some of the first things we were sensing body information. So we we're sensing things that uh, people uh, were carrying on them. I normally w wear a, a strap here that ha senses my uh, my uh, uh, heat flux and uh, skin resistivity and st uh, so, a thing called a body media right. or so a body the, bug. The, the underlying thing is these were flexible systems to be hacked in ways that you couldn't anticipate. That's right. And, and the idea was to make, make these systems as flexible as possible and so that they could be interconnected to. And it's so a toy chest for engineers, uh, yeah. basically. So basically I've the thing that's been the most I'd say the I've had the most fun with is sort of thinking about buses and connecting things over my lifetime. So in this one we had a a core, you know, processor memory and some IO and then wires radiated to connect to other things. And then we made a uh and the Actually, the PDP PDP five, uh, which was this, I'd say the forerunner of the eight, uh, was basically a a single wire that ran out, and you attach things to that. That, and then when we made the the PDP eleven, we had a single wire for everything, and so all memories and processors and everything connected to that to that wire. And by that way, people, when when we introduced Ethernet. Uh, because ether, the first Ethernets had was a single wire, and you connected computers to that to that wire. And I said, the, basically, I at that time I said the Ethernet is the unibus of the '80s. Right. In fact, that was, and so it was a two and a half uh, kilometer wire, and and you ran that wire all around, and you just connected things to that wire, and and. Uh, did your uh, and and made this big system? Talk about how this became perhaps the first video game. Would you say it is? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the interesting thing about that is being the first video game was uh, Harlan Anderson, one of the founders, I think, had discovered at the end of the year that he could give a computer away and get total tax <laughs> uh, deduction for that, and I think it. I don't know that whether that was the thing that made us profitable that year or not, but in fact we were we did we gave I don't know number I don't know what number it was, but it's very early PDP one to MIT, and so uh, right next door to the TX zero the transistorized computer its ancestor we put a PDP one in that that next door room and. Uh, and all of the uh, students came in there, uh, Steve Russell and uh, Peter Sampson, Alan Kotak came in and took a, lot, took a lot of the software ideas that were, had been developed for PDP-1 and transformed them onto, the, uh, or that was on the TX-0, put them on PDP-1. And that, things like all of the first, uh, first editor, which we called expensive typewriter, uh, debugging, interactive debugging, all the light pen uh, kinds of interactions, uh, connections, and then the, I think the most famous one that uh, is still in a sense in use uh, is, was Space War. And Space War has been used uh, for years to uh, arbitrate uh, different uh, uh, legal aspects of, you know, when did you you know, when people say I invented this by that time, and and you generally will find that find the fu some function like that in space war.